Welcome to episode 93 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Dad Talk, and I've invited Dennis Misagoy to have a chat. What's this all series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot or even none at all. This series is about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear some dads discuss ideas that you disagree with. And that's okay. Their voice is important and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Dennis talks about the intersectionality of being a libertarian and raising three unique children and his run for Senate seat here in Florida. With that, let's dive in and hear what he has to say. All right. Welcome to another episode of Liberty Dad, Dad Talk. And today I have Dennis Misagoy. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, that's good enough with me. When I say it, I usually say Misagoy just to get the long I sounds to try to, you know, keep gotcha. the Spanish Italianish pronunciation. But um, but yeah, as long as it's a hard G sound, there's All no right. problem. Gotcha. All <laughs> right. So I don't know. Luckily, I'll just be using your name, your first name through the episode, and I won't have to worry about messing up the last name too much. There you go. So, but we have Dennis today, and we're going to be talking about the unique nature of children. And then Dennis is also a candidate. So let's go ahead and get right into it. And Dennis, tell us about what you're a candidate, and then let's talk about this unique nature of children that you want to talk about and kind of introduce yourself along the way. So like just bam, just give, sure, give, it, sure. all, give, it, a, give it all to us. All right. Uh, let's see if I can balance this out. So on the candidate side, just to get this stuff out of the way, mm -hmm. um, I decided to engage in some real madness here uh, and file for the actually the U.S. Senate seat here in the state of Florida. Um, see, that's currently occupied by Marco Rubio coming up here in the 2022 election should be one of the more high profile ones. Uh, I would like for us to do a little better than 2018, where we didn't have any statewide candidates. So I'd like to uh, give us a shot at that. Uh, I think it's important. In the past, I served as a local uh, elected official. I was mm -hmm. elected back in 2016, served as on the board and then as the chairman of a special taxing district down in Miami-Dade County. Uh, I live in Central Florida now, though. but um, trying to think anything else I want to throw into that. Um, uh, I, I've got my URL down here in the, in the bottom of my screen somewhere. So, uh, if you want to check out more stuff about in terms of the candidate side, you can go there. Uh, and in terms of the family side, uh, father of three, uh, my oldest is 12. Gosh, I'm going to have a teenager by the end hmm. of this year, which is oh boy. scary. Um, that's my, my oldest daughter. Uh, my son, is nine he'll be turning 10 in february and my youngest is two uh we'll see if we get more besides that but um yeah uh as can be said you know fatherhood is an amazing experience and one of the things uh, as i was mentioning to as i was mentioning to you kind of coming into this that, that was really on my mind in terms of thinking about this was really you know how unique uh each of these kids are i think in particular with a lot of the discussion so maybe to make this uh more timely. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the way that some of the discussions that have gone on about education um, okay. in in recent times and the debates around it and, and sort of the decision making, one of the things I think that gets lost is, is this aspect of the kids being unique. And, and it's certainly something that I've observed as a parent, uh, in particular, where my two oldest um, I think really, really have been distinct, you know, and, and have distinct needs because, you know, even two kids, and it's something I can say I, I even observed as my, myself growing up, uh, or maybe not growing up, maybe I really realized it more as an adult, as an adult, and I looked at myself, my two older brothers, um, raised by the same parents in the same house, mm -hmm. you know, from basically from birth until, uh, you know, adulthood, and each one of us took very different paths. And it, it, and now having the experience as a father, one of the things I notice, and I guess I'm more cognizant of is the fact that, you know, when kids are born, I think some people, particularly those who are on one side of this kind of education debate, I think they kind of view kids as like a blank slate, as mm -hmm. if they're, you know, there's not something coming into it. Whereas for me, it, it to me, it's pretty obvious that the kid 
has an identity. I, I mean, I could take it from a religious perspective even because that, I guess that's part of it for me as well. But, um, you know, the, the kid is not a blank slate. When the kid is born, the kid has, a, has an identity, has a personality. That's not to say, obviously, the kid doesn't get influenced and conditioned by what you put around them. You can, uh, you can help the child grow and, and reach a greater potential, or you can stifle that potential depending on how you decide to um, how you raise the child, what you, what you offer them, what you, what you put around them right. and, and the interactions that you have with them. But, you know, each one of them is something unique. You know, I remember my, my oldest daughter um, and how she was early on. My, my son is, is a different sort of character. I, you know, have the very distinct memories of, you know, stuff he was doing, uh, in particular, and it's really funny between him and my youngest, um, how much, to what extent he's kind of like a daredevil. Uh, <laughs> we had like this little kid, like this little like baby rocking chair right. that I don't remember who gave it to us, but my son, before he could walk, so before he had finally, you know, given up on holding on to anything and just walking straight off, he would climb up onto the back of this rocking chair, grab the back of it, standing in the seat and be like, you know, shaking the thing like this, he, he would just do all the stuff. And obviously once he did get to walking and running around on his own, uh, you know, it was only just further from there. Uh, we would be at a playground somewhere when we were on vacation and instead of, you know, climbing on, like hanging off the monkey bars, he would climb up and walk over the top of it. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something the maybe a month or so ago, on like some kind of neighborhood barbecue over here mm -hmm. uh, in the neighborhood, he finds this one tree near where everybody is and just goes so ridiculously high. Right. Um, they've got this rock climbing thing at this gym uh, that the whole family signed up for. And so uh, he's been doing that and he's just, he's buried, man. he is a, uh, he is something else. Wow. And, and so it, it's different for, for, for each of the kids. My, my youngest is very typically very cautious about going off into things, but mm -hmm. um, you know, the eating habits are always something that's that's unique with kids as well. Um, it's funny. My oldest was fantastic from almost the very beginning. Would pretty much eat anything you put in front of her, except for one time. I think it was around when she turned one. We were at a, uh, I think we went to one of the uh, the buffet kind of restaurants over in uh, at one of the Disney hotels and stuff, and. We were there, my wife and I and the baby, and normally, like I said, she eats everything. And so we, we tried to bring all this up. Didn't want to eat anything that one night, only strawberries. We were lucky we found the one thing she wanted to eat that night, but it was, uh, it, it was an interesting thing. Um, but typically, like I said, she's, she's incredible. Um, you know, she's now she's super, you know, artistic, really good drawer and, mm -hmm. um, and into that sort of thing. Uh, trying to, you know, do a little bit of fashion and kind of st mm -hmm. stitching up some things and sewing stuff onto dolls and everything. Uh, my son is very, you know, wants to build things and is, um, yeah, I don't think he ever got into the frame before we, we got on. He's got it like his Minecraft pajamas on. And so he's, you know, very much into building stuff there and very much into kind of building, building pretty much anything if he's got an opportunity. If I've right. got to build something for around the house or whatever he's, um, and it's been that way for a long time. So, um, you know, each one of them has their tendencies and it's not, uh, you know, like I think, like I said, I think people, particularly in modern times kind of take some of this, and maybe, maybe not entirely because there is sort of these concepts that are also pushed, but I, I, I do feel like it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know, man, there, there's, um, some of these innate characteristics and, you know, each, each, each kid is unique and mm -hmm. part of that leads to them having different needs. And so, uh, that's one of the things I think about. And I think part of what led me when we were talking, when you mentioned to me, some of the other discussions that had on here was, you know, where people say, this is the way you should raise your kids or that's the way you should raise your kids. Right. Um, but, I mean, to some extent you want to have a, there there's some things i think that are universally the right thing to do but at, at the end of the day also every kid is unique and so i think every kid 
at the end of the day has some unique needs. They right. they need right. some kind of different. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it's just different sort of interactions. And right. I think I right. definitely observe that with uh, with my oldest daughter and my son. Um, is part of why they they don't go to school together. Right. Uh, which is sort of a strange thing. I think for most people to think of, uh, we're homeschooling my son. My daughter is attending a, a private school nearby, not too far away. But, um, you know, most people, if they're homeschooling, they're homeschooling all their kids. If they're sending their kid to public school or private school, they're sending all their kids to the same school. And um, that's certainly easier in a sense in that you're not like kind of bouncing around between these two two sort of worlds. But it's something that we kind of decided to do. Um, we had earlier on, and I think where my daughter probably needed a little more distinct advice. It's, it's interesting because mm -hmm. my oldest, mm -hmm. in the environment she's in, she she's she has some kind of a she has a certain amount of like kind of social difficulties uh, that she's mm -hmm. kind of going through right now, adjusting. Part of it because we moved up, and also because she she went into sixth grade, so inevitably she's in a different she's going to be in a different school environment than where she was when we were back in Miami uh but it was topped off by all the COVID disruption as well right which was another thing she struggled with like so many kids um uh, with kind of doing the remote schooling it, it, it was um that was a bit hard on her but um whereas my son I think was a little more flexible and and can do can do some things and can be a little more flexible and you know, what each of their needs are is a little bit different. But she, like I said, while she had some issues with that thing and she has some some struggles right now, she's also a straight A student, mm. you know, which is something I never even was. Right. So it's uh, it's just an interesting perspective. And, um, and it makes me also, like I said, appreciating and get a little more insight, I think, into my own upbringing to turn around and then look and see, well, you know, it, it, that probably has a lot to do with why me and my my two older brothers are not really didn't really come out the same didn't really follow the same paths why because we're just different right you now right. it's just some of that is just innate you know um innate in who you are uh i i would say your spirit you know pre-existing this life and uh mm -hmm. you know you you just have certain characteristics and a certain identity obviously again you get shaped somewhat by by what you go through in life but um again you have three kids same set of parents grown up in the same places for the most part um same schools even and everything but everybody follows different paths because right. at the end of the day we're different and uh it, it's something i've observed and you know something we can even uh if we then flip back to kind of um applying that idea to what we understand politics because um certainly as libertarians we are very averse to one size fits all solutions for pretty much anything right and right. i guess one of those things where sort of my my experience as a father maybe even informs that mm -hmm. because not that i didn't already think that and i didn't kind of already have that sense to a degree prior to becoming a father because i was libertarian enough at least little l libertarian sure um prior to prior to becoming a father i wasn't involved in the party and active until i had already had two kids mm -hmm. but but um it, it is something that i think <clears throat> reinforces something that i was think uh this actually is as sort of a concept from uh also that comes from from at least my own religion in terms of the idea that all truth should really fit together so what I observe as true as a father, um, in terms of the this aspect of humanity with right. my kids, because that's really what it's seeing. You know, we're seeing human beings start from nothing to grow into people, and um, the observation of that and, and what we learn about human nature in this process, you know, certainly should inform us in how we see humanity in general. Obviously. There's much more diversity in the world than it's going to be in my house, right? You know, than it's going to be amongst my children. But, uh, but there's not there's not a reason I can't learn something really useful for that. And I think that that is one of those things is that the needs of people are different. It's one of the reasons also why, you know, and it's funny as somebody who once upon a time was a public school teacher, and I think among libertarians, I tend to be. Shh, don't say that. 
<laughs> and I think among libertarians, I'm actually probably more, at least less adversarial to, mm-hmm. towards public school than most okay. libertarians. I, I'm more, I don't know if sympathetic is the right word, okay. but I'm more, what's the word I, I'm looking for? I, I don't know if I can find, quite find it, but I, I'm willing to try to find common ground and stuff. And I think that there, there's some other things to consider. But when you look at a lot of the debates that go on now, and even the debates that are going on now really aren't that different, where people are debating about the content that school is teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're talking about teaching for tests or the CRT debate, and really right. the CRT debate isn't that different if you go back to when people were debating about whether you're going to have uh, you know, are you teaching creationism in schools versus evolution? Or right. I'm trying to think of another um, abstinence only uh, oh, yeah. sex yeah. education versus, you know, so these kind of debates about what content has is taught in public schools mm-hmm. have gone on and just on different subjects. And so um, so this gets to the point of really almost, again, making the argument as to why you really shouldn't have public schools and instead um, I could reconcile maybe if people really want to have as a publicly funded thing, education, uh, different approaches to doing it. But at the end of the day, um, because there's such stark differences, and in particular, you know, I think a lot of people, I don't say a lot of people, but I, well, a lot of people, because that's a Mm -hmm. pretty vague term anyway, Sure. (laughs) um, have a perception about communities. Um, And particularly communities having necessarily shared values that the people who live in a particular area view things a certain way, and that those kind of shared values would be in a school. I'm used to living in a very, in a large metropolitan area. I grew up in Miami, like I said, and Mm -hmm. and the only other place, you know, aside from now, and I guess even now I'm in the Orlando metropolitan area, so technically speaking. And besides that, the only other place I lived was in the DC metropolitan area, so um so you're never, a city slicker it, through and through you know I, I kind of technically for the most part it's really been living in the suburbs mm-hmm. but um mm-hmm. but it is funny where kind of that sort of thought you know i think one of my brothers had a little bit different idea about whether we were really city folk or, or what and i'm like bro when we got out from our front porch in our parents house the house we grew up in from you know like i said from birth until growing up to adulthood you know, if I stand out on my front porch, I can see the back of the, the Televisa building on 36th Street that's across the street from the airport. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's the suburbs, but it's really sort of on the edge of suburban development. So, right. uh, but what I'm getting at is just that I'm used to being in places where there's lots of different people, um, different people with different values. I, I, to me, that's almost inevitable because even if right. you have a community that is, practically homogenous in that respect some people change their mind some right. people learn something new maybe somebody new moves in or they get married to somebody who's from some other place or whatever um people change people get different ideas and so you can't really set an expectation that geography right. and, um, equals you know values and stuff like that right. and so because of that is a reason why again public schools in the way that they're they traditionally work Mm-hmm. Um, and, and probably the way they would work always are, is problematic. And really the solution is choice. Mm-hmm. The solution is if you want your kids to learn, um, if you want your kids to be in a classroom where they're, again, uh, taught creationism and abstinence mm-hmm. only uh, and no CRT, you should have that choice. If there's, a, if there's enough people who have the demand for that kind of education, mm-hmm. a school will be there to, to provide that need. Uh, and for the folks who want the opposite or some other mix of all that, they there will be schools that cater to that audience as well. And that's the marketplace working. And and particularly in this day and age where we do have the technology for, you know, where people sort of make the the argument about, well, what if there's these one people out in this one place that don't have access to this or that? Are you going to put schools here? Um, again, I'm more used to where there's more population density but again even now like i say not to say that i want to send anybody to necessarily doing virtual schooling but if that's really all that's available or if that's the the easiest option you know again that should be an option that's there 
right. uh, homeschooling is another option. Um, but the point is more choices. Choices have never been a bad thing. Um, right. You know, I, I don't know anyone who thinks the world would be better off if we went to the grocery store and there was literally one meal that you could buy. And that was the one thing you ate every day. Um, and the stuff really isn't that different if you think about it. Um, you can throw some some things in there uh, to try to make problems with that. But the gist of it is, is a one size fits all solution isn't that great. Even if we say that we do want to have a consistent standard for this, that, or the other thing, but really, you know, what the needs are for people uh, isn't the same. You know, I think about, and I thought this was a, just a God awful idea when I was, um, I'm trying to think if I heard about this before I was, became a teacher, but I think it was, I worked as a substitute for a little while. And the one year that I taught in Miami was, uh, it's actually at my old high school, actually. But um, they had passed a rule in the county where every kid going into ninth grade was going to have to be an algebra one. Now, I knew from when I was in school that there were a lot of kids at that grade level who were not ready for that class because they weren't in that class. Right. And the only thing they did was set kids up to fail. Mm -hmm. And it was my experience because that's what I ended up teaching. Um, And so that was a problem. That was pretty rough for a number of reasons. Um, My first two classes in the day were kids, 10th and 11th graders who were repeating, which was also problematic for other reasons, but, but it was a, it was pretty bad. But one of the things I also remember in terms of talking about what kids need as a software developer, I work in what you would regard as a more, or what people would generally think as a more math related field. Sure. But, you know, I think back to it, the last time I've used the quadratic equation was when I was teaching algebra, right? You know, and we send every kid to this class, they're sending every kid to go to this class to use to learn this, this specific material. And it's material that I've literally, even in working in a Math centric field or, or, you know, right. math adjacent, whatever you want to call it. Um, I ne- have never had to use except for when I worked as a teacher teaching that specific material. So, right. Um, no, I hear you. I, um, uh, I write code for a living as well. And I, I didn't take computer science, but a lot of my friends have in college. And they're like, everything that I've learned in computer science is nothing that I've used in the real world. You know, and it's just like, it's almost like a running joke. And there's even a meme for those who might be, you know, watching this, that they'll recognize it. But it's it's something like, took computer science in college, and then uh, got a job trying to center an object on a web page or something like that, right? You know, and it's just this <laughs> joke about, you know, some of the... Um, the technology that's used to put items into place, you know, for people that are watching, put items into place on a web page. And there's a particular technology <laughs> that, you know, CSS that a lot of people are familiar with, and it can be a bit of a pain to use. And, and there's like literally, there, there's no quadratic equa- uh, equations, there's no math, you know, ne- well, I mean, there's some, but like for the most part, you're not really dealing with a lot of math. Um, any math that you generally deal with tends to be. Um, just your simple everyday math. I don't know if that's exactly. your, your same experience as well. I, yeah, but, uh, yeah but, it's, it's, it's mostly just divvying yeah. things up. I mean, there's not much beyond arithmetic. Right. It, do, it doesn't really go be much beyond that. So um, I, I, mean, I want to back up real quick. That, I want to back up real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. <clears throat> so you were, t- you, you know, you're talking about the unique nature of children, and then you were talking about being a libertarian. If I heard you correctly, you became a libertarian somewhere around your second child, correct? Well, I got active in the party. Oh, okay. Um, re- gotcha. Registered Big L and got active in the party um, 2015. Okay. So um, that's what I think that's when I first attended uh, county affiliate meetings. Okay. Um, my, my son had been born, who's my second kid. Uh, he was born in 2012. Mm-hmm. So few years after after uh he was born gotcha. but um but at that point kind of already having hit a stride in terms of you know having two kids mm-hmm. uh actually finally being kind of settled into my career in software development had transitioned over 
uh, not without some bumps, but like I said, I mentioned right. I, I worked a few years as a teacher. Uh, eventually got back, got over into into the software development field, and uh, it was kind of Kind of at that time when I was a bit settled in that way, career was going uh, in kind of its way. And then I decided to, you know, as a presidential election, the next one was coming up. I was kind of like, okay, man, I need to get involved. I can't just uh, gotcha. you know, sit back. So let, let's, let's talk about that a little bit here. Uh, you know, you, when it comes, so for anybody that's watching, who's not a libertarian, the, uh, one of the things about libertarians is that we tend to look at, every issue as a matter of the individual. And then we're like, look, individuals are different. We will, you know, you and I may agree on something, but kind of agree maybe for different purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like a good example of that might be you and I might agree and say, hey, uh, people shouldn't go to jail for drugs, right? And yeah. we'll agree ultimately that it's about the individual. Mm -hmm. And, but there are, but you might agree and say, look, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think people should do it, but, um, it's not my role to dictate what somebody else should or should not do. But I think of it as, you know, you know, a problem. I don't think it's a good idea. You know, there's a lot of people that yeah. like, are, you know, like that's not okay for them, but, but they don't want sure. to intervene. I might look at it a little differently and I might say, well, you know, like, if you want to have a little bit of fun, like, you know, why should the government come in and stop you, right? You know, like, it's cool, like, if you want to do some drugs. So we might look at it ultimately slightly different. So when you when you started observing your children <clears throat> being and, and you started really in um, interacting with them and really engaging in the unique differences, how did that affect or impact your perspective of libertarian views like because usually we think of it in terms of like here's how my libertarian views affected me in raising my children but i want to kind of ask it in the reverse and say like how did seeing the uniqueness really impact you as a libertarian and go wow you know what like this is this is a new revelation to me or whatever well i think um you know school choice is certainly one of those things and I guess it does add to my perspective, because if I think about it, look, I was a product of public schools, mm -hmm. K through 12, went to a public university. Um, and, and my oldest, my my daughter, mm -hmm. uh, she she did go to public school uh, for a couple of years where but that was mainly because we we did have a little bit of a personal connection. The right. Um, right. the teacher that she had for kindergarten, we, we sought out and we because we knew. Uh, she had actually been my brother-in-law's kindergarten teacher. My brother-in-law um, is actually uh, born extremely premature, Was mm -hmm. uh, uh, has cerebral palsy, but he, he's mm -hmm. very, um, very functional. And he's in a wheelchair, but he's, um, you know, and, and that particular teacher, my mother-in-law had credited with, um, you know, really helping him at that time. And in partly with that was uh, one of the reasons we, you know, we had my daughter go there. Um, and so there's a little bit to it, but like I said, it's, um, gosh, I think recognizing uh, that's certainly one area where in terms of the direct family um, experience, I mm -hmm. guess to say, where it, it, it informs that and gave me a, a sense of where, really what I may have taken for granted to say that, well, I just go to the school that's there and that's just it. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Versus to say, well, you know, that that's always the best thing for every kid. And, and, and recognizing that I think was one, um, you know, I think other aspects are just in terms of maybe how your sense of compassion grows, at least for me. I mean, we were talking, like you were just talking about the drug issue right now. And, you know, I, the way I raise my kids, certainly, I mean, is to a certain, to maybe to even a, a greater extreme, uh, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, mm -hmm. aka more commonly known as uh, Mormons. Mm -hmm. you, you know, as that, I mean, I don't have alcohol in the house. You know, okay, we don't even drink coffee. You right. Know? So, so this kind of stuff. There's a, um, you know, for us, 
even though I would never want my kids to be involved with drugs or any of this other stuff, at the same time, if they made those kind of mistakes, gosh, I would hope that they would not, you know, I, I couldn't think of anything worse to compound the problems that would come from that than them going to jail or anyone really. Um, you know, the recognition of the value of everyone. Again, I guess maybe how it adds perspective in terms of, because everyone's starting as a kid, you know, everyone has tremendous potential. It's one of these things also, I guess, when I think about when we talk about uh, foreign policy positions and you think about, I don't know if you're, um, you've ever seen this clip that I've seen band, uh, I've seen around a bunch, but it's like a clip from 60 minutes. This is from the 1990s. Uh, I think it's Madeleine Albright being interviewed about the the sanctions mm -hmm. uh, back when we had the no fly zone and everything in Iraq um, during, like I said, during the Clinton years, and they had estimated around 500,000 Iraqi children that had died as a consequence of the sanctions. Um, you know because the food is more scarce, people are more malnourished, more susceptible to disease, and they can't also get medicine and stuff. So as all that stuff was happening, and they ask her, you know, you know, do you think this is worth it? And um, like I say, the reason this clip is is often shared is because, you know, she goes and says, you know, we think the price, is, you know, the price is high, but we think it's worth it. And as a father, you know, thinking about that happening to children, happening to a child like your own, that's just beyond repulsive it is um to me indefensible and not just even in the sense of like the morality of it in terms of the the obvious gosh i, I can't think of a word <laughs> uh sufficient to express you know how um how awful this is but you know for as morally repugnant let's mm -hmm. let's use that word repugnant as this right. is it's a popular um, word in the libertarian community for yeah some. i know <laughs> um i'd call it irrational too but <laughs> but uh, but definitely repugnant right um, but but i mean truly truly because this, this is a serious thing no so um, I, I agree I mean, we're, we're talking about we're talking about children being killed and and the morality of it is one thing where it's so obvious to mm -hmm. you know the murder of innocence you know the most innocent mm -hmm people you can think of you know children who just happen to be born in this place um suffer and die for what but i take it a step further and i say when i look at my own kids and i think of the potential that they have i recognize that um all those kids had tremendous potential what what would it happen I mean, you think about how stable these have been, just the, the widespread disaster. Maybe some of those kids would have been the leaders today. I mean, we're talking about kids that were, born, that were kids in the 90s. I was a kid in the 90s. Right. Um, I was born in the 80s, but, um, you know, but, you know, all those kids would be adults today. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would they have accomplished? What could they have accomplished? What impact could they have had? And what would the world be like if they were here to make their contributions? Right. Um, there's things like that that I think about. And, and I, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily a direct influence of my experience as a father, but it's certainly something I didn't think about. Um, I didn't think about as much, mm -hmm. you know, as many years ago uh, as I think about it now. So. Uh, I, th I think those are a number of those things, you know, just really the value of, of each individual, um, their life, their potential, um, and the, how indefensible it is, the way that it is treated by the establishment, whether we're talking about domestically, where, where someone, mm -hmm. again, a young person growing up uh, in adverse circumstances for one reason or another, for example, gets involved with drugs and right. then their life is going to be ruined. You know, I, I forget I was last talking about with this, but you know, fantastic idea. Okay. The person has already made this mistake. They already have to suffer some consequences. I actually think I was talking about this at church one time uh, um, uh, when it was a Sunday school lesson and, and talking about the fact that, well, then we put 
charges on them and uh, and send them to prison. Now they get out, or hopefully they get out. And uh, sorry, I got something going on there. Um, and then they get out, and now they have a criminal record. How are they going to build a life back? You know, right. we're we're only exacerbating the problems there. And obviously, the, the in the in the foreign policy, I, I don't know if you've had an opportunity yet to to read uh, Scott Horton's the uh, Enough already. No, I'm a little behind on my reading lately, uh, partly because I'm a dad, and my son yeah. likes to shift the routine on me, and so I'm trying to get into a good routine. So like. There was a there was a time frame where I was trying to get up early because I would like, all right, I'm going to get up a little early, like an hour, maybe an hour and a half before everybody else. So I can go downstairs, have a cup of coffee, and then that's my time, right? And so I would go down yeah. and and maybe I would flip through Twitter. Maybe I would read a book. I, I would usually try to read a book. Uh, maybe I would just sit there and just look out the window and, you know check out yeah. I, I got there's a lake behind me and just kind of you know just stare and just just enjoy it right like whatever i felt like doing at the time but just kind of prepare myself for the day without any distractions and my son is not very you know routine oriented just yet yeah. <laughs> so and if and there was a time where it felt like every two weeks he would switch up the routine so i'd, I'd barely be getting into a routine myself and then yeah. i had to sh shift it so so i haven't you know i'm way behind on my reading um, right now, but, you know, but I want to ask you really quick, but, you know, and, and, and jump yeah. back in on the Scott Horton book and, and where you were going, yeah. but it seems to me that one of the val uh, one value of having, you know, three children or, or, you know, multiple children mm -hmm. doesn't have, doesn't have to be specifically three is that you, you get this, um, perspective of like, uh, in your case, you've got, you know, like one, two and three. And so you, you look at them and it's very hard to see your children or any children as a collective group. Because when you look at a collective group, then what you tend to do is to see them all through the same lens, right? And and, and that's kind of like I only have one child, but I, I'm one of three. And I did a lot of observation, you know, as I was growing up and – my sister and my brother and myself are all uniquely different. My sister and I are six years apart. My brother and I are 12 years apart. And like, I just, like, I noticed that my, my parents treated us differently. And I don't mean in a negative way. I just mean they treated us according to kind of our personalities, yeah. Yeah. you know? And I always, you know, the easiest way to explain it for me is always talk about spanking, which I know is, it rubs a lot of libertarians, <laughs> you know, it, it rubs them wrong. Like they get mad and, you know, and then, you know, I get into a little bit of a, you know, an argument with them, but, but I oh, got, you're in a safe space. I, I, yeah. So I got spanked all the time, right? Like <clears throat> it, the running joke is I got spanked once a day and sometimes my mom would spank me just in case she missed something. Right. Like that's the running joke. Now, when I say spank, I mean, literally like a simple, you know, spank on the butt. I don't yeah. mean, you know, so yeah, I, I'm not talking about like, things that like virtually everyone would agree is abuse. Okay. Yeah. No, my, my sister and my brother, they got one spanking, I believe ever each mm -hmm. one, one. And the one my brother got, I don't remember. I don't remember the one my sister got and I, I could be wrong. Maybe she didn't get one. I don't remember. I, I think she did, but my brother, I do remember the one that he got. It was really a matter of miscommunication. My mother thought that, you know, stories when they get passed along through people sometimes get distorted. And the story got to her that he was playing with a bunch of kids and he hit my brother-in-law with the baseball bat. Oh, so that's that's what she heard. Sure. And <laughs> turns out he was just being stingy with his toys and wanted to take them all home. And my brother-in-law was like, no, you can't do this. You know, you brought all these toys for the kids to play with. And in his rushed to try to you know he he jerked the bat and the bat hit my brother-in-law he didn't yeah. actually swing it at him so it was total miscommunication yeah. there right and uh, but my mother would uh, under normal circumstances she would just be like joe his name was joe she's like joe do you need a spanking or a hug and he would think about it and i was like dude seriously what what, you, what is there to think about here like the answer is obvious bro 
Like, what? <laughs> you know, and he would think about it, and then he would be like, well, I probably deserve a spanking, but I would like a hug. And then he'd get one. And it was, a, But, you know, it was appropriate for him. You know, so I, mm-hmm. I, I just kind of saw, like, how my parents treated us differently. And I don't think they treated us differently, you know, because yeah, they, just, they necessarily saw us differently. They just were like, all right, based on the personality, on the personality this is it's, what's appropriate. It's, it's, what's a, yeah. So, you know, am I, am I getting that yeah, right from you? That, from like, you. That's, that's, the, like, that's the, I'm getting an echo. Is that you or me? I don't know. If uh, I think that might've been just me talking okay. in the middle of you talking. So I'm not hearing an echo. So, oh, okay. I, yeah, I'm getting myself. Uh, I, echo, but... I was going to start talking in the middle, but then you hadn't finished. So then I stopped. Gotcha. Um, no, I'm hearing myself echo and I'm like, where is that coming from? Okay. No worries. All right. Um, so I was going to say, you know, I, I think, Look, it, it, it's almost as simple as this is, and this is also some one of these things that makes me, you know, just shake my head when I hear people talk about. Um, and I think it, I, I certainly hope it's a really fringe idea when people talk about, you know, kids being kids of the community rather than kids of the parents, because, right. you know, and, and you have this experience as a father, you know, nobody's going to love your kid the way that you love your kid, you know, and you're not going to love another kid the way you love your kid, even whatever feelings you may develop and certainly i've had some where you know um some that are close in the family or my wife's side um where i really have you know a deep love for for some of these kids but you know with your own kids it's it's um it really is something and and you know i for some reason it pops into my head the uh, you know there's an example example in in the bible and i certainly can't remember the scriptures but i think it's when uh when christ is teaching about you know how much you know heavenly father you know loves us and you know he makes the example of you know which one of you you know if your son asks you for a fish that you're going to give him a stone you know or if you whatever it, it's this example to try to say look if you know any one of us you know knows you know cares about our kid and wants the best for them and because you, you care about them and you want the best for them you're going to try to do what's best for them and sometimes like with with, uh with your mom asking your brother you know sometimes you really don't know and you're you're just trying to figure it out and you're trying to gauge what's going on we 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 had something going on with with my daughter today when she was you know kind of doing something else at 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 recess and again she's a good kid she's a straight a student but you know she, she she's she's having some of her struggles and you know a lot of what it ended up being after I picked her up, today, you know, was a conversation. What is really needed, and, and you know, the communication. Sometimes it's 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 not obvious. We do the best we can, but we do it because of the love we have for the kids. You know, we want the best for them, and it's it's something that goes beyond explanation. I guess it's it's like parenthood in general. You know, I always jokingly say, oh, but it's true, and I think most parents will tell you. Um, you know, nothing prepares you for that first day, that first night, you know, after the kid is born, I was jokingly say that the kid has no idea what nighttime is when they're first born. So that first night when you have to adjust to sleeping, especially when it's your first kid, when it's your first kid, um, you know, there, there's nothing anyone else can tell you to prepare you for it. And I remember, you know, so, no, the, the kid, the kid does not. The, the kid does not know what nighttime is when they're born. They're, they're not used to this whole day and night thing. So they're, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do and you got to deal with it. Um, and it's a learning experience. And like I say, there's nothing anyone can tell you. People can tell you till they're blue in the face until it actually happens, until you have that experience. You don't know what it is. Sorry about that. Um, is this, this is the tricky part for using uh when you use your uh your phone to also be for the webcam for this sort of thing. So uh <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um but gosh, what was it, man? The you know, the kids it's that that's the motivation behind it, and it's so so it gets us to try to do whatever we can and hopefully overcome whatever sort of dogmatic, um, you know, commitments we may have. Because if someone is like, 
dead set of thinking, well, you know, this is the only way to do it, or th this is what you have to do, or this is completely off limits. Um, and certainly there's certain things that should be completely off limits, but, um, but you know what some kids need is different and what, what the same kid needs in the same, in a different situation is going to be different and kids will also test their limits. And so it, it's hard for someone to say, um, absolutely 100%. This is what's needed. This is absolutely wrong. 100% of scenarios because none of us have lived 100% of the scenarios. Every one of us has a very limited life experience. That's another thing that, again, I don't know if if it necessarily comes with fatherhood, but it's certainly something that I've, you know, been more mindful of as a father. Um, you know, I will, you know, my life experiences are uniquely my own. And so is everyone else's. And I will, you know, as much as people can say, I understand this, that, or the other thing. And, and you can to some degree, you can somewhat intellectually or, or in other ways. But at the end of the day, you know, your perspective is still somewhat limited. Broaden it as much as you can, learn everything you can, but you, you, you face these limitations. And at least if you're mindful of it, you can recognize and avoid some of the pitfalls of thinking that you know better and thinking that you have all the answers or thinking that even in this one area that this is the answer um particularly in this area shoot The, the, kid, the kids belong to the community rather than to the parents. I think there's a, I think there's a little bit of both. I think it's it's a balancing act. Look, if if I'm teaching, and, and this is part of, and this is one of my thoughts about education in general, and I think I would certainly apply with public education, <coughs> is that you know what should the responsibility of the teacher be? Um, you know, on the one hand, I think, in particular for me, I taught math for one year and I taught uh, computer programming for uh, three years. You know, to me, it should be cut and dry and I'm teaching the material. And the material is the material no matter who the student is. Um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get them to learn is the same thing. Now, those kids, for the most part, chose to be in those classes. Obviously, not the math class, but, um, but you know, the material, on the one hand, the material is what it is. And, and it should be that to a certain degree. Um, the needs of individual students may vary. 
So, so you, you try to balance that out. You try to set a baseline. Here's the material. I'm going to present it to everybody. Some people will need more help or some people will need you to kind of bridge a gap. But you try to, in your presentation, maybe give a little more than just what the one, you know, more than just what your best student needs. You know what I mean? More right. than just what the, the guy who gets it the quickest, that's not where you stop. You go try to get uh, cover everybody as best you can. And when you present a lesson, and then you, you know, obviously you try to fill in the gaps when you can actually see, be with the kids as they sit down and work. So it's one of these things where, you know, you, tr you do the best you can, but, but it's a balancing act. I think one of the, and, and this is actually, it's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about it recently, but so, uh, something I'd thought about in terms of one of the problems that we get into um, with how we talk about schools in modern times, and again, part of how it gets politicized as well, well, this is no less about the politicization, at least not overtly, is that I do think that there's a thought that's going on out there where they expect teachers to be like the substitute parent um, in a sense to try to like inculcate serious values. And this is also one of the things where I, I get, I really shake my head um, at some of the parents to get overly, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not just overly passionate, but I think if, if when you're overly concerned about the influence that a teacher will have on your kids, if you're a, a teacher, like a high school teacher, I saw a kid, I would see a kid for 180 hours in a, in a year, okay? Because you have 180 days in the school year, typically, and I'm one period. So they're in my class for maybe an hour. And that's assuming they miss no days. Okay. If I'm going to have an out, if I'm going to have a bigger influence on them in that time, than you, their parent, you know, there's, there's something to me that's, that's not quite right there. Um, and that's not trying to point a finger or anything, but, um, but I do. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, th I think I think I think that I think that I think there is still something to it, and obviously, again, um, but and, and so I'm going to say I think it goes both ways. Um, I don't think it's good for, you know, parents and others to expect teachers to be substitute parents. I don't think it's also a good idea for teachers. I don't think it's good for teachers to try to be substitute parents. Um, uh, I think, you know, there is a certain idea. I guess a, a phrase I've heard before, I, I hadn't really thought about it until just now, but I guess I hear a phrase of like molding minds um, as a concept and, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, I would rather just, you know, a teacher teach the material that they're doing, you know, the material substantive to whatever relevant to the subject matter that they're doing. Um, it'd be a little more cut and dry at least. And you would get out of this contentious stuff, but you know, that's what some people want. Uh, and it is unfortunate, but it, it leads to how this all gets so politicized. And gosh, I had a different thought about that aspect of it, but, um, no, I mean, I, I think there is something to it because if the kid is, you know, has a consistent message about something, um, you know, throughout the day, I guess you can say, but I don't know. I, I think of some of those cut and dry subject and maybe stuff has changed. Um, the last time I was, like I said, really spent much time in public schools would have been um, 2008, uh, would have been the last time I was uh, uh, teaching, at least teaching in that environment. I, I, I taught adults for a few months. The, a year later but um but that was a different experience too so um so go ahead sure. hey.
Sure. Well, I, I, I'll bounce back to kind of the thought that I had when I, when I brought up the um, Scott Horton book. I, I, I find my easiest way to uh, kind of get through this stuff is doing the audio book thing that I can do as I'm driving places and whatever. Not that I even drive that many places now because I've been working remote since uh, March of 2020 now. Um, yes. <laughs> so um but uh but as i've been kind of going through it you know i knew it was bad and i thought it was bad um but gosh it's so much worse than i thought it was um and you know as i was talking about the sort of already how I, I view the value of human life and and you know the I don't know, the sanctity, the preciousness of human life and everything. And then when I hear about sort of the thought processes that have gone on, you know, by the guys at the highest level, you know, we talk mm -hmm. about uh, Bush and Obama and, you know, as he kind of goes into some of the background about it, with Bush, part of it is this, you know, really sort of repulsive idea of like, oh, well, the group become a great president or to have some kind of great legacy as a as a US president is to be a wartime president. Um, to for that to be a thought um, without really a consideration of what the cost of that is. In particular when you you start wars that you know are completely unnecessary. The and I didn't hear it there, but I know I'd heard it in the past that I think it was like the first cabinet meeting of the of the Bush administration where they talked about making war in Iraq, you know, and, and certainly once 9-11 happened, they were just desperately throwing stuff at a wall to wait for something to stick to find a rationale to justify that. And in a similar vein, uh, when he talks about Obama as he came into the White House and his decision to go full tilt on drone warfare. Again, pretty much for political expediency, because he didn't, he, you know, his understanding and belief was that he couldn't afford to look like he was being soft on terrorism or whatever, even though this was guy was elected, presumably on this whole promise and the thought of getting out of conflicts, of removing the U.S. from Iraq, uh, guy got a Nobel Peace Prize before he did anything, and um you know, and instead, really, just a uniquely evil sort of thing. And and he, and he talks a little bit about it. The the experience of the folks um, in some of these places like Pakistan who were living under this threat of, you know, unmanned drones killing people, seemingly at random. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't, the CIA wasn't putting a whole lot of effort in checking evidence after the fact to see if the people they killed were actually terrorists or not. They just kind of assumed it. And some of the other political considerations, like if you just kill people, you, you never have the specter of, oh, the enhanced interrogation, or you, you never have these pictures come out. You never have this, that, and the other thing. Uh, a lot of the other political, um, downsides to capturing people and figuring out if you're going to put them in Guantanamo or wherever else, uh, you solve all these problems by just killing people, um, killing sure. random people. And it's, it's incredibly, I don't know, man, I, I, I struggle to find words for it. But if you value human life and you think about the reasons that are behind this stuff, and then you think about what the experience of those people is, um, talking about people who are afraid, you know, children going up afraid of clear days where you can see the sun because that's when those machines can see you clearly, you know, not going out in big groups and, and everything, like just an entire, think about an entire community adjusting to life with, you know, killer robots flying, flying through the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in particular, that whole sort of thing of it happening, somebody half a world away controlling machines doing this um where it's not even like a normal soldier who is at least somewhat at risk and has some reason to be averse to conflict i would think um 
So it, it really is uniquely the, the more I the more I learn, the more it just crosses those lines, man. And it, and it it really it's hard not to be affected by it. And again, having the perspective and and the view on human life, I I, th- I would like to think more fathers have it if you can. Um, project yourself and and your children into these kind of experiences um you know i I, to me it's indefensible and you know it's topped off by other aspects of what's wrong with those policies in terms of you know all of the the problems with blowback and um obviously that we can't afford this stuff we've already hit 30 trillion in debt now i've been saying for for quite a while that we've been just hurtling towards it now we're here and you know, it's, it's up to people, I guess, to sort of segue to this other stuff, you know, people want this stuff to stop. Uh, and particularly here in Florida, um, you know, it's hard for me to necessarily gauge it. It's not like I have a uh, access to, um, or the, or the, the ability to go and do so much research on it myself to be able to go polling huge numbers of people. But, you know, I tell you what, what we can expect, we know with our incumbent, you know, has been a consistent, you know, essentially a neocon on the foreign policy. He like, he enjoys the saber rattling against everyone he can. Um, Rubio, I recall as the Ukraine stuff was heating up, was talking about, you know, at, at the minimum, you know, if, if Putin were to invade Ukraine, he should be facing like a, a, like a well-funded insurgency that we should be supporting and everything else, you know, this kind of stuff, like what we've been doing in the middle East and everything, which has been working out so great. Um, uh, which is, uh, I guess not as bad as direct warfare with the, you know, the country that has the next largest nuclear arsenal in the world, but is, is still pretty awful. And again, you top it off with, again, in, in some more conflict and, um, and again, the fact that we can't afford it. Um, and Congresswoman Demings, who's likely to be the Democrat nominee, the, the overwhelming favorite for that, uh, you know, she stays completely silent on this sort of stuff, that has you know, no, uh, no public position she wants to take, but she votes for it. She votes for every NDAA, um, every increase. We're, we're at over three quarters of a trillion. I think it's something like 760 some odd, maybe 770 trillion trillion, excuse me, billion, uh, three quarters of a trillion, but it's 760 billion or so. Um, and then they want to, and I, you know, you, you, the numbers are hard to, the, the numbers are really difficult to think about, you know, and it's, it's mind boggling. And then I think the house was trying to push through another bill to add even more money to give, uh, weapons, more weapons to Ukraine. I know they sent a bunch of stuff already, uh, some, I don't know how many tons of ammunition, you know, what, what's the signal we're sending and, and obviously, again, what's, what is it we're pushing for? Um, and again, it's another one of these conflicts that the more you learn about it, the more it doesn't make sense. And, um, so, Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hmm. I think that's a pretty good compromise. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's it's a good compromise. I understand where folks, and obviously as, as libertarians, we, we can certainly sympathize with saying, well, we don't actually want people going through this thing and being documented by government and, and this and that. But, but I think it's, it's it, I don't think it's an unreasonable as a compromise. It was, uh, as long as you otherwise, you don't have restrictions on people who can come in, you allow people to come in legally and, you know, they go through a little screening process, but instead of it being, you know, years and thousands of dollars to lawyers and whatnot, is you show up at the port, you don't need a visa and all this and stuff. You just show up, you go through the screening for a few hours, especially with modern technology in terms of doing background checks and whatever. Um, and if you're good to go, you're good to go and you go and you go get and you go and you find work and you you start to build your life and just have fun. Um, but I, I think it's reasonable. I do think I man, I, I get frustrated with this stuff. I I am a guy who who looks at it as still looks at it from the standpoint of look if you're not violating anyone else's rights anyone else's basic natural rights what we say you know life liberty property if you're not violating any of those you should be good to go on your way and entering the country um getting a job renting a place or whatever none of that violates anyone's rights any of those rights inherently none of those actions do that uh, i do think though that th there's overwhelmingly too much to do about nothing um because even where there's disagreement and, and you know not to you know, let's just i'll just put it out there because i think it's it's interesting because you know one of the guys i think at this point because I, I remember there being more like sort of really like the borderarians in the past who were like oh you need to have you know controlled border and this and that it doesn't seem to be quite that much. There, there's this weird sort of nuanced position that I still don't agree with. But, you know, we had the big debate uh, at the end of last year, gosh, the end of last year, um, with uh, Dave Smith and Spike Cohen. Right. And even Dave Smith, who is perceived by a lot of the open borders folks as being like this anti-immigrant, whatever, when, right. he, when he actually says what his, the, the policy positions, he says, well, abolish Homeland Security abolish ICE and pretty much get rid of all federal immigration laws so that it sort of devolves to the states, which is constitutional, I think, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're an open borders person, how do you not get behind that? Right. How, how, how do you object to that? Even if you don't agree with necessarily his views on stuff and, you know, there's some philosophical disagreements about whether, well, you have the right to do this or not, or right. whether, you know, I, I think the, the the worst thing is arguing about how popular it is. Right. Um, Again, that should that should be somewhat irrelevant to us, and I think, right. um, well, maybe irrelevant in the sense, maybe relevant in the sense of how, what are you going to lead off with? Yeah, um, it's. To, I didn't see the debate, but correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me that a lot of your closed border types in the libertarian community would otherwise be open borders if it were not for the welfare state. Like that's their big objection to being open borders. But otherwise, if we didn't have the welfare state, it seems to me that a lot of them would probably be a lot more either sympathetic or just jump right on over to the, you know, hop on over to the open border, so to speak. So it, my guess is that, uh, my guess is the reality is, is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Now, my, at least my perception, my experience in the past, um, there have been uh, some, and I think even more, 
more leaning on the conservative side who said things like that, like, well, you can't do this as long as you have a welfare state. Um, you have to get rid of the welfare state first. Mm-hmm. Um, it is more recently, and, I, and, I, and then not to negate that one, there's been this other sort of weird argument. Like that wasn't the argument that was that was made in that debate. The okay. argument in that debate had more to do with, um, I think, more relating to sort of the nature of public land and and how what what is valid to to put as restrictions on it and there was a lot of things thrown in there that i thought were kind of red herrings when people try to compare it to like okay well is public land just completely open so for example like a public elementary school do they just have to let like you know some weird you know 55 year old guy can just hang out in the elementary school bathroom Uh, um you know, but I, I think that's that's sort of a red herring discussions like that. Uh, I think, well, I don't think it was in the in the debate, but somebody else then said it in like a commentary when I was kind of back and forth on Twitter where it was, uh, you know, uh, is it OK for like a public library to put a restriction so that, you know, some guy can't be shooting up heroin inside the library. Um, but I think those are really apples to oranges when we're talking about, uh, you know, free movement and immigration. You know, we're talking about people traversing uh public land that is by default completely wide open to the public mm-hmm. um you know streets and sidewalks streets and right. sidewalks um which by default everybody can travel on um there's nobody checking you as you get in and out and if you if you accept the idea that government can can reasonably place any restrictions on your ability to um go on to any public land uh, if you accept that, then then the lockdowns become totally legit. Uh, they can put the entire country mm-hmm. on house arrest. And uh, you know, if, if you accept that, right? So, and I don't accept that. So, uh, it's it's not a it's not an argument that I find super compelling or, or really compelling at all. But uh, but it is a little different than the whole. Well, you got to get rid of the welfare state first. Gotcha. Um, okay. I, I do think I do. Th- think some of these and, and i i don't like to paint people i don't want to ever i don't want i don't like to assume the worst of people but i think at least what i see when when people are just trying to find different excuses because one of the things we talk about also is um and i'm sure you've probably seen this kind of conversation where somebody says oh well they need to come in legally and say well mm-hmm. okay do you want to make coming in legally uh easier or do you want to make or are you okay with just making it so that everybody who comes in is legal and now everybody's legal and nobody's illegal, uh, you know, are you down with that? And they say, no, of course not. Uh, they like there to be some kind of restrictions. I think in a lot of those kind of cases, you know, the, when the people say, well, you got to come in legally. And if you say, well, let's make coming in legally, you know, super easy. And they, they don't want to do that. Um, I think has more to do with fear of change. Okay. Uh, just a, a general fear of change. And it's the same kind of thing with uh, what we call NIMBYism. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't want the place that they live to change. And this is this, we're going to tie this back to the fatherhood thing um, because this was uh, an interesting kind of experience and and, uh, perspective that I've gained in the last year or so as my oldest has kind of struggled with us transitioning um, from Miami over here to central Florida and, Mm -hmm. and going to a different school and everything and not being around the same people is that, you know, she kind of wants to hang on to the way things were and, and, you know, have some of the same things. And one of the things I tried to impress upon her and, and, and kind of really thought more about myself is the fact that, look, people, and and it was, it goes back to also the Trump slogan, you know, he wanted to go this make, make America great again. This whole idea is common among conservatives to hearken back to these good old days of, you know, whether they're envisioning the 1950s black and white sitcom with the white picket fence or, or whatever it is, uh, even Biden's basically, you know, campaign, you know, what was it, uh, you know, restore, restore the soul of America or something like that. I don't don't remember what his was, but it was, uh, but it it basically amounted to let's get back to the good old days of 2016. Gotcha. Basically all the problems are everything that's wrong with the world is, is Trump. And let's just get back to that. Right. Um, you know, there's always this sort of hearkening to go back to the good old days Mm -hmm. and or even just what you think you have 
and not wanting things to change. But one of the things that that was on my mind and kind of thinking about that sort of thing initially is that number one, the only things that don't change are things that are dead mm-hmm. in a community that is alive and, and things are things are always going to change. Right. Um, even if you stay in the same place and you never move, things around you are going to change. The the building, the the home that you live in mm-hmm. will start to deteriorate. Um, the, the world is just going to change. The world is always going to change. Um, and are we better off being afraid of it? You know, I, and maybe it's easy for me to say be, from coming from my background and perspective, maybe it's easier for me than others, but I do think that there's just a general fear of change. And, and certainly it is sometimes openly expressed where folks, you know, the whole thing about a taco truck on every corner um, was one of the ones that Trump said, I think, uh, when he was running in 2016, um, you know, s- some of those ideas and where people are uncomfortable with that, uncomfortable in particular with like, you know, large Hispanic populations in their communities and they don't want to, you know, the whole English only thing. It's it's funny where I have, um, it's funny in particular having grown up in Miami, um, seeing like photos from like the 1960s of people in Miami picketing saying, you know, speak English. It's funny to see that having existed in Miami, because obviously we're far past the point sure. down there. Sure. But, Sorry, uh, yeah. but um, it, it's, you know, I, I think in some ways it's natural because mm-hmm. we build, uh, we build a connection with the world we're in with everything we have. And like I say, we, in particular with my daughter, you know, she's like thinking about, well, the school she was going to and some of the friends that she had, mm-hmm. um, some of the friends that, uh, you know, the kids of one of my wife and I's friends from church. Um, and, and we're like, look, even if we stayed in Miami, you know, you can't stay in the school. You're, you're older now. You're, you're going to have to change that anyway. And, you know, the friends who were, you know, some of her best friends down there also, they moved away. They don't live there anymore either. Mm-hmm. So even if you don't mm-hmm. want to change, even if you stay back, the world's not going to stop changing. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, how do you communicate that to people? Because I don't want it to be an adversarial thing. And I don't want to be be in a really negative way to say to somebody, Hey, just get over it, you know? Right. But at the same time, you know, I don't, I don't have the secret sauce to necessarily say to somebody, Hey, um, you know, come along and you just get over it. Right. But I, I, I would like to be able to assuage people's fears and also help people recognize that look the world is going to change the world has always been changing and it's going to continue to change and i still hope that it will continue to change for the better Mm -hmm. you know but certainly there are things that we think need to change that um uh, obviously aren't going to change in the right direction uh as long as the status quo continues right but in general i think that uh and and i guess it's a challenge to make the case how the world changing in these ways with these kind of demographic changes and, and large migrant populations, whether we're talking about what exists today or what people imagine would exist if, uh, if we had open immigration, because that's, I guess that's what people fear. Um, people have this idea that, well, if we, we adopted this policy that we'd have, you know, a hundred million immigrants coming in, um, something that would really upset the demographics. Uh, I'd argue that we could handle a whole lot more than that. But again, that, that does really change the dynamics of sure. things. And, uh, but then again, I, I always try to also make the point when people, when we talk, have this conversation that immigration and naturalization are separate, um, you know, people coming in doesn't make them citizens. And so even if the demographics overall of the community are different, you know, if you're concerned about, um, you know, policymaking and stuff like that, that's certainly something that the native population is citizens we'll we'll still right. have a firm grasp on for for the time being um there's a lot of considerations but yeah. um it, you know that that's that's a thought in terms of the fear of change i think that drives a lot of it and that drives a lot of things like i guess um in terms of people also not wanting uh, what you see particularly out west where you have just these um uh you know all of the the housing issues issues right. where they just don't right. want to build 
housed to meet the needs of those communities yeah. um, where the the incomes are so high mm-hmm. even then they can't they can't figure it out because they just don't want to allow change and and we get some of that over here it's mm-hmm. obviously more in the more in the urban centers where they don't want to again uh, allow somebody to build the kind of housing to meet the demand of there right. is at the prices where there's the demand, uh, which again goes into to sort of other free market, uh, real need to get rid of some government barriers to that sort of thing. Right. Because what happens right now, obviously, is where there's a where there's a public sentiment to do that to prevent those sort of things. But the question is, how much should my neighbor get to? Dis- how much say should my neighbor have in how I use my property? Right. You know, that's a question, and uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know. Modern nations have typically erred on the side of saying, well, yeah, they have a lot of say in because Mm -hmm. it has an impact on them. But um, but there's a trade off, uh, just like with everything. Right. uh, As uh, as Soul says. Yeah, I think it's important to point out to people and, and you can see it differently. But I think that, you know, you mentioned this fear of change and whatnot. And I think a lot of people kind of frame it as this negative kind of like bigoted fear, like almost like people have went out and made some decisions and then kind of brought the fear upon themselves. But I think honestly, um, to use that same word twice, I think it's an honest fear. And and I think it's more of a generic fear, like people fear this change and this disruption to their daily lives more so than it's like, you know, I don't think I don't. I mean, I'm sure there are some, but I don't think most people are like, "Oh man, if we had open borders, why all these migrants are going to come over and they're going to, you know, slaughter us or whatever, right?" Like, I I, I think it's more of a concern of like people are going to come over and they will disrupt the life that I know. Yeah. And and what am I going to do about it? Because there's two unknowns. <laughs> that are sitting there there's the what's this disruption going to be right and and nobody knows and then also how will i handle this disruption right and and i think you could tie that into fatherhood in a way you you know where people might be like if i have a child what's that disruption going to be like and then how am i going to handle it you know i certainly had no idea when we were having you know we've only got one child at the moment and I had no idea what, what I mean, I, I had some ideas about some things as a to, you know, of toddler and children from being around them and just kind of observing and seeing some, some common things that you might see and experience, but I never personally experienced them. So I still had no idea, like, how am I going to respond to that when it actually happens? Right. And, and, and I think that's an honest fear that people have with anything in their life, whether it be immigration um, having one child, having three children, moving from Miami to the Orlando area, you know, moving to a new state, get, you know, getting married. Like, it, and I feel like one of the things that's not present in these conversations is the acceptance that people might have honest fears that just simply need, like you said, assuaged. Uh, do you agree with that? Or do you think I'm, you know, just kind of making up stuff? I mean, I, th- I think Feel that's. To say. I think that's. I think that's. Uh, um, I think that's. I mean, I think the reality is a, is overall a mixed bag, but I think that's a lot of it, and I think it's something also to 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 tie it back to kind of the fatherhood experience is, you know, for the first, you know, twelve years of my well, first eleven years of my daughter's life, um, first eight years of my son's life, uh, we were we were in Miami, they're growing up in roughly the same similar area to mm-hmm. where I grew up. But there are a lot of things of the aspect of their experience is different from mine. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things where it's because you will like man. who I am. Well, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, I like who I am. Mm-hmm. And I, even if I didn't always enjoy every experience growing up, um, I like the fact that I had those experiences and where I had them. And I guess it's a weird thought of just thinking, man, I wanted my kids to be growing, you know, maybe it's just a natural thought to think at first that, um, 
and, and maybe it's just sort of a natural thing in, in kind of this old world sense where people, you know, families would live in the same village for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, generations and generations, and they would grow up and the kids, they would, you know, work similar professions, they would learn mm -hmm. things the same way, they would, you know, follow in the parents' footsteps. And, you know, that's not the world we live in. But right. maybe for some people, they, they either assume that it was or that, that it will be. And certainly, it's funny because I definitely didn't have that. I mean, both of my parents were immigrants um, and had very different experiences. Um, so, but it's just weird because I guess raising my kids in, the, in close proximity to where I grew up, I was just in my brain sort of took it for granted. And mm -hmm. at some point eventually kind of had to let go of that. And particularly, especially by the time I moved over here, I'm like, well, my kids aren't going to continue growing up in Miami. So they're not going to have all those same reference points. They are still from there. That's where they were all born. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a different experience. And again, I think because we form these bonds with those experiences and the places and the, mm -hmm. just the way things are, it's sort of natural that because we, we have that attachment to it, that we fear something upsetting it. And, but again, I think what we, what I, what I have learned, and again, I don't know that it's something I can necessarily impart to people and it's something I can really give away, but what I have come to appreciate is the fact that everything is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, and it can certainly change for better or worse, but the change is coming is inevitable. The best we can do. And, and I think I thought about this also more in the last uh, couple of years with my, with my father passing away was that you, you can't get away from this. You, you, the only thing you can do is, is hang on to the experiences that you have, appreciate everything you have, mm -hmm. um, the memories you've had and, and all of that and just take it with you. And, right. you know, some buildings and places won't survive or you just won't have a chance to go back there or things will, will change in other ways. But that, that's part of life. Yeah. Um, you know, it's never going to be that every building you you set foot in as you were growing up is going to be perfectly preserved and exactly the same so that you can bring your kids there and they can see exactly what you saw. That's not going to be anyone's experience. And and that's probably pushing a little farther. I don't think anyone's really holding out hope for that per se. But again, they're they're holding on to not just a world, but a time and place right. in this world that cannot exist forever. Right. Uh, that is, it's a fleeting moment. And I think we, I guess we maybe we get convinced that we can hold on to it or that it can be permanent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, that I think that fuels some of that fear. Uh, but like I said, it goes beyond the immigration thing. Right. Uh, but, but I think it is a factor for a lot of people who, again, just, just a general fear of change. And that's just one way that it manifests itself. Um, so, so it's one of those things where I prefer not to, to think the worst of necessarily everybody mm -hmm. uh, who, who, maybe is a little more reticent about opening up the border. And it's interesting because I remember even uh, one gentleman who donated to my campaign, but when he donated, uh, he sent the check with the letter and he saw, well, you know, I'm not really sure about your, your, your immigration position and this and that he, he's, he's a little more reticent about it, but he's still supporting me in the campaign. Right. And I, you know, had a little bit of back and forth with him to kind of express, you know, and, you know, he's like, okay, that, that seems reasonable. Um, you know, and actually, I think his might have been a little bit more of the, uh, I'm trying to think if it was a little bit more of the, you know, the conflict of having a welfare state and whatnot. And I'm like, but, but I still think um, that we are, we are better off allowing migrants to come in so that where there's a demand, for, you know, even just from, from the individual rights standpoint, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as well from just a uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Not just economic prosperity, but just, you know, in our best interest, right. um, you allow labor to flow into markets where there's a demand for it at the price that it can be offered. And you have a more efficient economy. People can say from another standpoint, well, that depresses wages. It'll depress some wages, 
where it's you know directly there. But again, that also keeps down the price of goods and services, which means that there's more money left over from everybody who's spending on those, those things to be able to create new opportunities mm -hmm. or, or to be invested in something or whatever. But it, it, it will open up other things and that will, um, again, at the end of the day, if an economy is more efficient, so instead of spending, you know, twenty dollars to get, you know, product X, now you're spending, you know, ten dollars or five dollars. Right. You know, now that's more efficient because you've got that much more money and you still got the thing you need. If you have to pay more and you're still getting the same thing or less, that's a bad trade-off. And that's right. not a way that we can as a as a community. I hate I I I was almost about to say as a society, but, um, you know, we improve the quality of life. Um, right. We improve the quality of life without increasing the cost of living. You know, that's how we bring it down by, right. by creating efficiency. And the marketplace does that um, sort of the natural forces that are there as long as we don't screw it up. Right. So let's, let's wind this down. So give me a couple of minutes of your pitch for Senate run to kind of, you know, a couple of minutes tell us, uh, you know, the major points of your campaign and then where people can find you. And then we'll go ahead and close this episode out. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll keep it broad and say, look, we, we all can observe a, a huge number of problems around us. One of the ones I think that's hitting most people, the most, uh, hitting people in the broadest sense is the current economic situation as the president continues to try to gaslight everybody into saying this is a great economy mm -hmm. everybody's feeling a pinch from inflation right uh, we mentioned the 30 trillion in debt this is all a consequence a predictable consequence of the irresponsible spending and just inflationary monetary policy that has enabled that irresponsible spending uh from the two parties mm -hmm. uh, both of the uh, who you're going to get as the candidates from those two parties are both going to be on the side that has created the situation. But it's not limited to just the spending and inflation. The inflation is one of these things that's hitting us right now. And there's no, no solution on their end for this. Uh, the solution is to live within our means and to not inflate the currency. Um, further down, I, I, I think everybody deserves, every American deserves a dollar or they deserve money that when they go to spend it tomorrow, it's worth at least as much as they it was when they earned it yesterday. And that's not something we have right now. Right now, you earn your money and it's losing value. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Uh, other people kind of kind of calculate more, more uh, how big a problem that is and, and really how bad it's going to be. But it's something that needs to be dealt with. And we wouldn't be at this point if those two parties were willing to deal with it. And certainly not the two uh, candidates that we're likely to get from them. In addition to that, we like we talked about with the foreign policy, there, there's um, morally indefensible uh, just policy of trying to pursue global hegemony for the U.S. Mm -hmm. It makes no mm -hmm. sense, and it costs an immense amount of human lives. We didn't even touch on certain aspects of it. As we touched about on the aspects of you know people dying out in the field, but um, certainly U.S. casualties, and not just the casualties of our own soldiers in the field, but also uh, everybody who's come back dealing with uh, with uh, PTSD and other mental illness to uh, so many driven to suicide, record numbers uh, in in at least the time that it has been recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the numbers are are off the chart and they're disturbing. And uh, again, are we going to learn anything from it? Are we going to listen to the people who are there that are telling us that this is all a waste, that we don't belong here, that we shouldn't be doing this? Uh, and again, we can't afford it. Um, so many of these other policies that are destructive, but, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the COVID policy, you know, we here in Florida really haven't been quite hit as hard directly by it. Um, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. had some, but some of these other things have been a, a consequence of that. Certainly the inflation has been kicked into overdrive, uh, by the COVID response. All of this stuff though, is a predictable consequence, like I said, of what we have in the two party system. Uh, we have two parties that essentially accept this idea of an omnipotent government. It's, it harkens back to like the believing in like the mandate of heaven, only instead of mm -hmm. a king, that's you know, the Congress and the president. Um, but they're not omnipotent and they're certainly not supposed to right. be. Um, 
we as libertarians have a recognition that, and I, and I think it's an American value, that the power of the government comes from the, the people that it governs. And there, it, government can have no power but that power which we can vest into it. So it, these powers that they assert and to be able to do these things, they simply don't have it. It's not legitimate. And when you go beyond that and you go beyond what I think would be the proper role of government, it, it inevitably creates all these sort of problems and it's what we've seen. And right. so if we want to get out of that, if we want to get away from it, we have got to take action. We cannot wait. Um, and that is at least the one tagline I'm trying to keep on there. If you go to the website, which is over here, as we said about where to go find me, over here, mysticoy.com. This is the great part about having a weird last name is that I can just get the domain name and right. put .com at the end of it. Um, if you go there, you know, the, the one line I have uh, as kind of the slogan there is change cannot wait. Now, I understand, and particularly from my own experience as, a, as, um, as an elected official, my first two years as a, um, as a supervisor on the board in my old community development district, uh, I was opposed by everybody else in the board. I couldn't get anything done. The only mm -hmm. motion I had that even got a second were to adjourn meetings or to approve meeting minutes. Okay. Anything else I tried to do died for lack of a second. I lost any contentious vote four to one or three to one, you know, depending on if everybody showed up for the meeting or not uh, for two years. And I was able to get some change in afterwards, but I recognize that even if me and every other libertarian running for federal office were to win in November of 2022, we would still be pretty powerless to enact any sort of meaningful agenda and reforms. Uh, we would still be at the mercy of the old two parties, but we've got to start somewhere. Okay. Right. People, you know, I know you've heard this, I'm sure any libertarian and certainly anyone actively trying to promote libertarianism has heard this, well, you know, maybe I'll get behind him, you know, when the party's more viable or when the candidate's more viable, the candidates and the party isn't going to become viable magically on its own. Right. Um, we, it's, it's on us to take, uh, to take action, to make it happen. I, um, I've made the, the analogy recently and I will continue to do so. Could you imagine if the, if in the, the American revolution, that was the approach that most of the people who signed up for the uh, Revolutionary Army would take, well, you know, I'm going to wait until the the colonial army is up to even strength with the British Empire mm -hmm. before I, you know, step up and volunteer. No, they 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 understood the need to take to take action, and there's a cost, and there are consequences, and you don't get results overnight. They didn't get results overnight, and we wouldn't get results overnight, but. The right. question is, when you look at everything that's happening, can we afford to wait any longer? Um, I think a lot of the things we talked about in terms of uh, the spending, the, the economic, the harm from the policies that we've seen, uh, the harm from the foreign policy, uh, the harm from many other policies. We talked about drug policy way earlier on. The harm from all that has a toll and to speak up against it and to give an alternative to it, I believe deserves a spot, uh, at least on the ballot. Uh, I honestly, I think it deserves a seat in the U.S. Senate, but that's on everybody to, right, to make that decision. But I think people need the alternative here in Florida. Um, we certainly haven't talked about some stuff like criminal justice reform, but but those are other issues where there really isn't going to be an option if you just have the Republican and Democrat, right. Um, so the question is, is are we willing to take, like I said, with those, those, uh, those soldiers in the Revolutionary Army to take decisive action, to put something on the line, to, to invest, to give what we can, and uh, to make a sacrifice? Like I said, um, there are costs and there are consequences, but we, do we all recognize the, the importance of this? I'm putting myself out here as the candidate, I've got a little bit of experience in public office and trying to do the best I can. Uh, it, it would be nice if, if I was in a situation where I could do, do a bit extra and, and put more time into it. But I think we, we need to have somebody out there. And this is the, you know, this is the question for us and the challenge for us. Are we willing to step up? And in particular, also in this race for Florida in particular, 
our U.S. Senate race is likely to be one of the most profile ones uh, this coming election cycle, uh, as we obviously have a former presidential candidate in Rubio and Val Demings, most likely who was pretty big in the Biden Veep stakes uh, back in 2020. That's weird to say back in 2020 and not just right. last year, but right. Um, so, uh, and particularly also for us here in Florida, we have pretty, I don't want to say advantageous, but at least relatively fair ballot access laws. So we, we also should be taking advantage of that. And I want to do that. And I want to give us uh, an opportunity and a voice mm -hmm. where we can say, give folks an alternative, give folks something different to what they're getting from the two party system. Uh, we can't, we can't be upset about this message being rejected if we never give people a shot. And yeah, I know we've given them a shot. We give them a shot every four years in the presidential election and they, and they have taken it. But um, again, if not now, then when, you know, what's the breaking point? What are we waiting for? Because if we wait, the process will only take longer. We've got to start somewhere. And so uh, I think it's essential and, and it can't wait anymore. I mean, as I posted when I, um, once I saw that the debt had gotten over 30 trillion, you know, where do we draw the line? Right. When, when are we, when are we ready to step up and take action? And, uh, you know, from my standpoint, uh, I, I always want to implore people don't wait until November. Cause if you wait until November, I probably won't be there. Um, you know, I need folks to kind of step up and, um, support in whatever way you can, whether that's a contribution or, or volunteering, uh, whatever it can be, uh, because this is this is a big job. It's not anyone can do alone, right? And uh, you know, I do the best I can. Uh, it's certainly not an easy thing. As we talk about fatherhood, for most of the time here, you know, I'm I'm a guy who's got every reason to kind of sit back and you know, be much easier to focus on stuff at home and work mm -hmm. and family mm -hmm. and the kids and and everything and and certainly taking days and nights away from here you know, going off to the, uh, the LPF training last Sunday, right. You know, we've got the convention coming up later this month. Yep. Uh, I'm going to go out to Seminole to a meeting in Seminole County on the 16th. So all these kind of things, it, it, it takes a toll and sort of taking you away from, uh, you away from your family. And I wouldn't do that if I didn't think this was that important. I try not to ask more of anyone that I'm asking of myself. And so uh, when I ask folks for support and, and to kind of step up and help out, this is, uh, this is what it's all about because we, you know, as, as far, as long as the, the odds are for success, we know what the cost is going to be. If we do nothing, we know the path we're on, mm. you know, mm. and isn't that good enough of a reason to to take action to try to right. stop it. Yeah. The odds are long. So, awesome. uh, you know, I hope folks will. And you can find me, like I said, over here at the website, and, uh, you know, the information, there's issues, you can donate, there's a, there's a, a link to fill out a form if you want to volunteer in some way. Uh, but whatever you can do, I would say, if you can't contribute, contribute what you can, but, um, but yeah, man, I think that's the pitch. Awesome. Well, you heard it, folks. Uh, Dennis Misagoy. Go to misagoy.com, M-I-S-I-G-O-Y.com, and uh, make sure that you donate or reach out. And, you know, if there's another way that you can contribute to his campaign, then go ahead and do that. And I'm glad that everybody tuned in. Hope you got something out of it. Uh, you know, Dennis, a father of three, also he, the uh, Senate candidate for the Libertarian Party of Florida, running against Marco Rubio. And who'd you say the other person was? Uh, most likely is Val Demings. I, right, Val I, Demings. Couldn't even name you. I couldn't even name you any of the other uh, Democrats who filed. Uh, okay. She seems to be the only one who makes any noise. So uh, Congresswoman right. Val Demings, I'm trying to think, is it the 10th district? Uh, I know it's the one here in Orange County. Uh, her, okay. her husband is actually the, the mayor of Orange County. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, so, so those are the opponents. So, you know, uh, don't check them out. Just check out Dennis. Just go to his site. That's all you really need to know. And with well, that, that's the one where you find policy, right? <laughs> and 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 with that, uh, let's go ahead and end the show. So thanks for tuning thanks. in. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, 
be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me an email to libertydadpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Prefer an audio format? Then head on over to LibertyDad.com or just search for Liberty Dad, all one word, on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.